yeah. got me uh, mics so I can walk around. Perfect. Hello. Hi, hello. Wow, it's quite loud. Um, hey, everyone. Um, my name is Siobhan, and uh, I'm a PhD student in the Department of Anthropology. And um, I'm from the UK, if my accent didn't give that away. Um, when I was studying uh, as an undergraduate, I took international politics and social anthropology as kind of my, my combined majors. And I was thinking at the time that anthropology as I was being taught it in the UK was really quite dry and it was quite frustrating. And I was thinking, how can I, how can I do anything meaningful with this? And, and how, can I, how can I be an activist, really? Um, and then I took a, a feminist international relations class. And in that, um, one of the assigned readings was uh, a book that you might have heard of called uh, Bananas, Beaches, and Bases. And really reading that, my eyes were open to a, uh, a type of research that could be done that was uh, meaningful on so many levels, that could be uh, read by undergraduate class of politics students and change the way they thought about the world, but also could resonate on much higher levels, as I'm sure it did, and I think we all know that it did. And I know that that book is being set in some of the classes that some of the students here are taking Today, and I think that it's got an enduring appeal. Um, and one of the most amazing things about being a PhD student is that sometimes you get to write emails to celebrities. At least they feel like celebrities to you because you read that book, and that book changed the way you thought about academia, and that book made you maybe want to study academia some more. So um, when Dr. William Leap of Anthropology Department contacted me and said, um, you know, I've been thinking, one person that you might want to contact about the Public Anthropology Conference is Cynthia Enloe. It took me about a week to get up the courage to actually send that email. Um, and they say that uh, you shouldn't really meet your icons, but I, I think that uh, the idea has been blown out of the water when I finally got to meet um, Dr. Enloe here. And before that, in uh, communication with her, was uh, really put at ease. Um, she's a fantastic scholar. She's edited uh, the journal Signs, the International Feminist Journal of Politics, um, as well as Bananas, Beaches and Bases. Uh, she's very well known for uh, The Curious Feminist and uh, Maneuvers, the International uh, Politic... <laughs> Sorry. I, it has a different title in the UK. It does. It's, it's called Does, uh, Does Khaki Suit You? Does Khaki Become You? Oh, okay, okay. Um, so, we're very pleased to welcome, and I hope you can put your hands together, uh, Dr. Cynthia Enlow um, to the Public Anthropology Conference 2012. What a nice introduction. Thanks a lot, Siobhan. Um, it is just great. I can't believe it. It's a beautiful Saturday afternoon, and you are all inside. Um, this is really, this is very impressive. It just shows what anthropologists are made of, you know? You really um, know how to prioritize your interests. Um, I'm delighted, as a humble political scientist, um, to be here amongst um, all of you uh, anthropologists or wannabe anthropologists or could be or might be or soon to be anthropologists. Um, I think that um, when I come back in, you know, in some other form, um, I really, what I really want to be, okay, here's what I really want to be. I want to be a historical feminist anthropologist. That's what I want to be. Um, and uh, 
So it is a great honor um, and a great pleasure um, to be amongst um, all of you um, and to have had time uh, both this morning and this afternoon go, to go to some of the best discussions I have heard about what it means to be and to attempt to be an intellectual um, in this day and age and um, in this kind of very difficult uh, political setting. So I'm very appreciative of your attempt um, to really make anthropology responsible and responsive to public concerns and to really see yourselves as citizen anthropologists. And that's a very loaded combination. Citizens loaded enough, anthropologist is certainly loaded. You put together citizen anthropologist and you've got a very demanding agenda for yourselves, but I'm very glad um, that you're taking it up. Um, when Siobhan and I started talking by email um, as to what might be um, interesting, um, I found myself thinking about uh, what it takes to be taken seriously. And this is one of these themes that has kind of bubbled up because of um, being very fortunate and being asked to do talks in various places around the U.S. and in other countries. And um, I'm oftentimes struck by how hard it is for people with a uh, feminist approach to public life to be taken seriously. And we oftentimes have strategic conversations about that, about why it's so hard. But what I found myself thinking about is, why is the notion of serious so loaded? Because I think increasingly that to be taken seriously um, is considered to be an accolade, right? And most of us work very hard to be taken seriously. And to be taken seriously means that what you say matters. It matters to the person or the people who are listening. And since you can't control their ears, you have to struggle to figure out what it is you have to do, what language you have to use, even what topics you have to explore, how you have to present yourself in order to be taken seriously. So I think it's a very political um, adjective, a very um, political adjective when it is just serious. Um, that is, what's a serious topic? What's a serious question? What is a serious person? Um, and because it's so loaded, it gives a lot of power to the people who can bestow it or the people who can withhold it. And of course, we all do this ourselves. I mean, every day, several times a day, we, um, oh, um, we met over lunch, so I understand. <laughs> um, but every day, each of us are in the position, even if we don't think of ourselves as very powerful, we're in the position of taking seriously or not taking seriously topics and people. The more I thought about this, the more I realized that being taken seriously in any culture at any time um, is deeply gendered. And by that, I mean that the workings of presumptions about manliness, the workings of presumptions about masculinity, and the dynamics, the processes of who is considered a real woman, or what is truly feminine, or what is respectably feminine, are at work in being taken seriously, or at least as often, being denied the status of a serious person. And that leads both women and men um, to engage in that politics of being taken seriously rather differently. Oftentimes, since a lot of the topics um, we've been talking about today um, have to do with governing and governance and governments, um, it means that oftentimes it is people with public authority who have the option of taking you seriously or not taking you seriously. And since in so many settings, um, those people who hold public authority oftentimes um, have the mantle over their shoulders 
of masculinity, and there are many different kinds of masculinities, um, that then adds to the challenge to be taken seriously when you don't control their ears, you don't control their estimations. Um, and I have watched in many settings where women with feminist insights and feminist knowledge and feminist findings from their journalistic or their um, university research, I've watched them struggle to find some way to be taken seriously by people who don't want to take them seriously. I'll give you a couple of recent um, examples. One that um, some of you uh, know, I know Hugh Gusterson knows this very well. Um, there is a, a very renowned scholar uh, named Carol Cohn, who is also a good colleague of Ann Tickner, who's your new distinguished professor here in the purple shirt. Um, and Ann and I are longtime colleagues of Carol Cohn. And Carol, that's C-O-H-N, in case you want to go look up her work. Um, and Carol Cohn is a longtime investigator of um, the politics of uh, nuclear weapons and weapons of mass destruction, particularly asking how the workings of masculinity and femininity shape both academics but also policymakers' attitudes towards and interactions with nuclear weapons and nuclear strategy. And Carol, because she is so well known, was invited by Hans Blix. Now, you'll have to think back to what Americans call the first Gulf War in 1990 91. And Hans Blix, B L I X, Hans Blix was the Swedish um, uh, expert who was called upon by the United Nations to um, head a team that would monitor and evaluate whether the regime of Saddam Hussein in Iraq was engaged in developing a nuclear weapons program, not just a nuclear uh, power program, but a nuclear weapons program. And so it was Hans Blix who found himself um, in the UN setting, as particularly in the fall of uh, 1990, found himself directly at odds with the administration of George W. Bush because Hans Blix and his inspectors um, came back and after their own investigations in Iraq, came back with the findings that there was no well-developed um, nuclear weapons program being um, engaged in by the Saddam Hussein regime, which was not news that was well-received by the administration at the time of George W. Bush and his um, advisors. So this put Hans Blix, now you'll notice that what we're dealing with here is a duel of masculinities within a highly public setting. Right? Um, and so Hans Blix found himself trying to be taken seriously by other heads of delegations in the United Nations because that's where this was going to be battled out with words and with ultimately votes. Um, and Carol, a, two years later, was invited by Hans Blix to come to Stockholm, because there is now the Hans Blix Commission on Weapons of uh, Mass Destruction. Very, very interesting group in Stockholm. And they invited Carol to come with two co-authors and present to the commission, which is a very illustrious group of serious people, um, a paper on what gender analysis can add, can shed any light on discussions of nuclear weaponry. Now, you look down the list, um, of all the papers that have ever been invited to be presented at the Hans Blix uh, Commission in Stockholm. And this, you will quickly see, is the first one that even mentions gender. Which, of course, made Carol very nervous. Because have you ever been, I'm sure you have, have you ever been in the position where you're the first one to introduce a feminist idea? 
to a group that you're afraid has never willingly listened to feminist ideas, uh, not to mention ever taken gender analysis seriously, and you feel this enormous weight because if you can't get them to take these ideas seriously, you have a feeling they'll never listen again and this is their only chance. So Carol and her co-authors worked on this paper time and they worked on it for a long time and we had many discussions. I wasn't one of the co-authors, we had many discussions. And it was really, the stakes were high. The stakes were high because the stakes were, will gender analysis be taken seriously as a result of listening to Carol Cohn present the reasoning behind using gender analysis, not as the only approach to the politics of nuclear weaponry, but rather as one of the important, significant, useful, valuable approaches to nuclear weapons. At the end of her presentation, would they take it seriously or would they not? So off she went to Stockholm, and one of the things she decided to do, I mean, when you have an opportunity like this, we were talking about this in the afternoon session about journalism and anthropology, public anthropology especially, but when you have an opportunity to speak to people who other, and then they were there because they're part of the commission. They weren't there because they all wanted to hear a feminist um, analyst. When you have an opportunity like that, um, you really have to think hard about making the full, the fullest use of it. So what Carol did, so just to, now put yourself in Carol's position. Okay, you should already be perspiring, right? <laughs> you should be really nervous. Um, and what she decided is, is that she would talk, not just she did talk in general about well, what is gender analysis? What does it look like? How do you know if you're doing it? What do you miss if you don't do it? But she decided since she had Hans Blix literally in the front row, she would use Hans Blix's own experience to make a point about how gender operates in the international politics of nuclear weapons. So she used as an, an example, and she had researched this, and she thought that there was a lot of validity in it. She said, for instance, one of the things that the George Bush administration did was play the politics of a hierarchy of masculinities when he tried to under, when he and his administration, not just he personally, when his administration tried to undercut um, the seriousness of Hans Blix and his inspectors, that they would portray the nuclear inspectors as merely men with briefcases, that they were not really tough-minded that they were not really um, able to come to grips with the hard realities of international weapons politics, that they were mere technical experts, i.e., they weren't really manly men, and that the spokespeople for the Bush administration, on the other hand, knew as real men how to face the hard facts, how to come to grips with unpleasant realities, how to stand up to those realities and take action. Here are all the gendered notions in that. So it was really, in Carol's presentation, she wanted to make clear to the commission that there are a lot of ways in which all kinds of, wep all kinds of weaponry the Kalashnikov, all kinds of weaponry are deeply gendered. But that in this particular instance of the international debate over whether a military intervention in Iraq was justified and the UN should support it or not, that the stratification, the hierarchy of masculinities came into play. And it was one of the reasons, not the only reason, but one of the reasons that, in fact, um, a lot of the findings of Hans Blix and his team's reporting was, in fact, dismissed, not by all, by any means, but by many of the major players in 
um, at that time. Sorry, this is now, I'm, it was first, the second Gulf War, second uh, war in Iraq. So now we're talking about the fall of 2002 leading up to March of 2003. I'm sorry, I mixed up my two invasions there. So we're talking about the fall of 2002 moving and getting more tense as we're moving towards March of 2003. So Carol Cohn, on behalf of her trio of researchers, um, presented this in Stockholm. And it was met with some mild interest. I wouldn't say there was a standing ovation. I wouldn't say that Carol was immediately called upon afterwards to come back and give workshops to the commission. You know, it was, it was everyone was very polite and some were really quite intrigued because it was all so new that most of the people on the commission had no gender analytical skills, nor had they ever realized they ever needed them. But they were interested um, because, you know, it was presented very well and it, it's, it is a, a, a very important set of skills that everybody should have. If you come out of American University or any place else and you can't do gender analysis, um, you have de-skilled yourself. So there was some interest. Um, you all believe that, don't you? Um, so, but Carol came away and she talked with her other two uh, co-authors who weren't there and afterwards and, and talked to several of us as well. And it was a little crestfallen, you know? It was your one chance and you thought, uh, I don't really think I made a big impact that had a lasting effect on how they'll try to understand the world or what questions they'll ask in the world. She was glad she did it, and, um, but she was just a bit disappointed. So then about um, two years later, Hans Blix was invited to do a major talk at Tufts University outside of Boston, where Carol Cohn at that time was a visiting professor. And so Carol was very, very interested to hear him speak because she's very respectful of him. Um, and so she went to this big lecture that Hans Blix gave um, at this Boston-based university. And as everybody was coming out of the auditorium afterwards, and Carol was in the audience, so she was just coming out, and Hans Blix was coming out with his hosts as well, Hans Blix spied her and said, I just have to tell you, I've been thinking about my briefcase ever since. Right? And he wasn't kidding. He said, I've been thinking about that. I think you're right. I think there was a, a contest of masculinities being used to sway members of the United Nations and members of the general public to discount our team's work as not quite manly enough and therefore not as serious as the work being presented by the Bush administration to the public and to the United Nations. So for two years, this talk that didn't seem to be taken seriously turned out to be taken very seriously by the main person in the audience that Carol hoped to have an effect on. He began to see a set of dynamics at play that he knew he didn't have any training in understanding, but he now had an inkling that he'd never had before. He had an inkling that gender matters and that gender can't be just reduced to women, all right? That, that gender is about how any of us are taken seriously or not taken seriously if we're perceived as either masculine or feminine. Now, it is true that in most political settings, in most countries in the world, one of the ways to dismiss an idea or dismiss a topic is to feminize it. And feminization is one of the processes of political life in many countries, certainly in the United States, but not only in the United States. If you can feminize something, if it's a patriarchal system, so that includes most countries in the world, 
If you can feminize a topic, or feminize a group, or feminize a, a person, you can, in a patriarchy, make those people seem less serious. You can paint them with the unserious brush of naivete, of domesticity, of even idealism. You can use the patriarchal notion that people and things that are feminine are not to be taken as seriously as things or people who can be portrayed as masculine. So the politics of seriousness, I now realize, is at play constantly, but it is very hard to really see it unless you have gender analytical skills, unless you really can follow the ways in which feminine, femininity is wielded, wielded like a tool, unless you can follow the ways in which masculinity, in all its guises, is wielded in the public uh, sphere. One of the success stories, it's not a total success, but it's um, certainly moving us all forward. One of the success stories of the last 12 years of international political life is the passage by the United Nations Security Council of a resolution that I bet a lot of you have studied um, called 1325 on Women, Peace, and Security. 13, and it's always referred to as just 1325. And it was passed by the United Nations Security Council in October of the year 2000. Now, what is stunning about the passage of 1325 is that it is the first resolution in the history of the United Nations, so that's since 1946. It is the first resolution in the history of the United Nations that specifically and explicitly dealt with women. Which means that for 40 years, members of the UN Security Council, who remember they are appointed delegates from their own member states with five veto-wielding permanent members and another five rotating members, but they are all government officials. It means for all those decades, nobody thought that, because nobody thought that anything to do with women was serious enough to have an explicit Security Council resolution. And if you study the United Nations at all, you know that the Security Council is the most, it's not, certainly not necessarily the most interesting, but it is the most powerful unit of this very complex multi-agency thing called the United Nations. So at the most powerful level of the United Nations, until October 2000, nobody thought that anything about women's lives was serious enough to be object of a UN Security Council resolution. So it becomes really interesting to think, and we know now we've got some documents and we've got some oral histories, it's really interesting to think how did and who did manage to change that notion of seriousness. And that means we're talking about years leading up to October 2000. And what we know is that it took a, an alliance, a network, not as formal as an alliance, a network, a very smart network of um, feminists in war zones and outside of war zones who have spent time in war zones. Because 1325 does the following. Well, how many people have ever read 1325? Have you ever had it? Like a, there's one. Two, anyone else ever read it? You know what, if you're, for whatever reason, go, you can find it online. Just Google UN Security Council 1325, resolution 1325, and here's what's interesting about it. The, all the, um, the prefaces, 
because the, all the prefaces, uh, which are because this, because that, because that, because that, because that, therefore, right? All those preface, preface, that's feminist theory. That is gender analysis at its best because the preface, which was worked on for four or five years by a network of transnational feminists, the preface says, because wars are fought this way, because victims are treated this way, because peacekeeping is organized this way, because ceasefires are negotiated this way, because, 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 therefore, we need to change our understanding of where women are, not just in the aftermath of a war, but in the making of any peace accord, any peace accord, that women need to be decision makers as well as treated as victims and to have recognized that sexual violence has become, and has been in many wars, but not all wars, has become so integral to the waging of war. Now, until 1325, and I would say really until, oh, good for you. Aren't these, should we give these people a hand? Really, they're great. So, so until this feminist um, gender analysis of how wars are waged, but also how wars are ended, and what happens in post-war, because 1325 is an analysis of and a call for a change in the way wars are waged, the way wars are ended, and what happens in what is euphemistically called the post-war era, or the nation-building era, or the peace-building era. But until this group really began to devise this very tightly thought out and documented uh, transnational feminist analysis, you had presumptions, and here are two of the presumptions, that were widespread in the world. One is that there is this thing called a battlefront and a home front. And the people to be taken seriously were the people that either controlled the battlefront from afar, because they were oftentimes on the home front, actually, either were on the battlefront or controlled the battlefront, and the people you did not have to take seriously were the people who were, quote, merely on the home front. We all know who they are, right? They're the most domesticated people in a society at war. So that was one of the particular dichotomies. And it's a deeply gendered dichotomy, even though a lot of men actually stay on the home front for all kinds of reasons. And we now have histories that tell us that more women than we ever imagined have been on the formal battlefronts for generations. But that, those histories weren't taken seriously. And so you had this gendering of take seriously those people who either control the battlefront or who are on the battlefront, usually wearing some governments or some insurgencies uniform. And you don't have to really be serious about the people who are merely on the domestic home front. So that was one major presumption that had prevented women's experiences of war being taken seriously at the highest levels of international politics at the UN Security Council. Now, thanks to a lot of you here in the room, we, in fact, have loads of research showing, in fact, that governments do take women very seriously when they are waging war. And we've now got studies of the British government, the Soviet government, the US government, the Japan, I'm talking about very specific studies, 
French government, the German government, the US government, and how they spent a lot of strategic energy trying to control women on the home front. But in public and amongst lazy, lazily thinking um, officials, that was denied. And so you had the dismissal of women's wartime experiences as serious topics of international policy making because of that presumption of the battlefront and the home front. But there was also the presumption, an insidious presumption, but a widespread presumption amongst women and men that sexual assault in war was just natural. Now, a lot of you have taken women's studies courses, haven't you? We have Yumi Park here from Georgetown, the director of women and gender studies at Georgetown, and we had a good laugh over this last week. Um, if you take women's studies courses, you'll notice that you cannot be a women's studies faculty member without going like this. You go like this all the time. The reason is because you are always challenging what people call, think are natural. And they only, so you constantly say natural, right? and real men and real women. You know, you just constantly do it all the time. And the reason you do it is just to flag the social construction of each of those things. Well, one of the most widespread in many cultures presumption was that sexual assault by men of women in wartime was natural. And what you began to get in American English, sometimes in British English as well. You'll, if those of you who speak other languages, you'll have to tell me what the equivalent of this is, if there's an equivalent. And that is loot, pillage, and rape. And usually, it was said as if it were one word, loot, pillage, and rape. That is, that it was as unavoidable Something that's unavoidable is not something you're going to take very seriously. You take things seriously that you think you can change, that you think you can have an impact on. It was unavoidable, it was natural, and it was trivial. That is, a soldier stealing a farmer's chicken was not really that different than a soldier sexually assaulting the male farmer's wife. Loot, pillage, and rape. That also was widely embedded in international and state public policy. Because if you believe that, if you believe that sexual assault in wartime is natural and trivial, then in fact you don't ever have to make any policy about it. You don't have to feel responsible for it. You don't have to be held accountable for its happening. A year or so ago, I was very fortunate, and I was on a panel in Buffalo, University of Buffalo, SUNY Buffalo. And it was a panel brought together um, by Brenda Moore, a wonderful African-American um, sociologist who works on women in post-traumatic stress. Terrific scholar. And she organized this um, conference to talk about women and war and post-war. And I was on a session. It was just a, you know, a table up on a little stage. And there was Rhonda Copeland, C-O-P-L-O-N. Rhonda Copeland, Lepa Mladjanovic, L-E-P-A, Lepa. Lepa Mladjanovic and myself. But what's really important is Rhonda and Lepa. Rhonda, who just unfortunately died last year, Rhonda was one of the key feminist international lawyers who would have an effect on redefining war crimes, redefining them so that now the permanent war crimes tribunal in The Hague now actually will prosecute something that they never, ever before would prosecute. That's Rhonda. 
Rhonda, who in the early days of all this new technology, actually used to travel with her fax machine. Honestly, really. And so, so Rhonda was kind of unstoppable. And Rhonda was part of this international network. And LEPA, who she had worked with, LEPA was one of the um, key activists in Belgrade, that's Belgrade, Yugoslavia, Belgrade, Serbia, Belgrade Women in Black. Now, a lot of you have followed Women in Black. Is there a Women in Black um, chapter here in Washington, do you know? You don't, don't think there is? Yeah, I mean, it's in some, it, Women in Black organizes very spontaneously. Nobody takes notes. There are no officers. You just, you want to form a Women in Black chapter, form it, right? And, um, and the, the two most uh, publicly well-known Women in Black groups are in Jerusalem. That was the very first one, which was against uh, Israeli militarism, and they stand right on the busiest intersection, um, uh, all dressed in black, just holding signs against the occupation and against war. Um, and the other that's become particularly well known is Belgrade Women in Black. But there's women in black in New York, there's women in black in Fredericksburg, Maryland, because five women decided to form a chapter. There's um, in Montana, I've met women in black. They're very important in Rome, in Madrid, um, in London, in Tokyo, um, in Osaka. So that's LEPA. But LEPA was part of the network in the former Yugoslavia who began to document the sexual violence of male fighters against women in the 1991 to 95 Yugoslav War, which tore apart Yugoslavia, leaving only separate fragments. So that's who was on the stage. And somebody asked a question about 1325. And this is the historic moment. Rhonda turns to Lepa and says, Lepa, did you first say systematic wartime rape? Rhonda pauses. No, no, Rhonda, I think you're the first person who said <laughs> systematic wartime rape. Now, the point is that systematic wartime rape, that phrase, that is absolutely the opposite of loot, pillage, and rape. Because loot, pillage, and rape says it's natural, there's no systematic um, decision making, nobody can be held accountable, nobody in particular is responsible. They, as feminist activists and thinkers, they, working with feminists in many war zones, including Rwanda, they had come to the conclusion, based on their investigations, that in fact, not all, but many sexual assaults on women by men in war zones, in fact, are deliberate, planned, and strategic. If that's true, you can prosecute. Right? So systematic wartime rape, the word that is most radical is what? Systematic. That changes entirely the local politics and the international politics of sexual assault in the midst of war. And that is the phrase that is in the mandate of the new permanent war crimes tribunal. That first went into the mandate of the International War Crimes Tribunal for Yugoslavia and the International War Crimes Tr Tribunal of Rwanda. Nothing like that had ever been thought or acted upon in the history of humankind. They managed to get that term to be taken seriously. They did it by documenting. They did it by presenting their findings in place after place after place. And they were eventually taken seriously. That's why 1325 was passed. None of the delegations, none of the state delegations or the delegates 
None of them did that work. That was work that was done by international feminists, investigators, activists, and thinkers. It changes the politics of seriousness. It means that even though 1325 is far, far from being fully implemented, far from being fully implemented, that in fact there is the basis for changing what we take seriously when we look at wars and when we look at the conclusion of wars and when we look at this thing called peace building after the ceasefire. So it is possible if you have networks, if you do the research, if you develop the language, if you are persistent, it is possible to change the gendered politics of seriousness. But I'd leave you with this. Keep a log, just to yourself, on your iPod or in pieces of scraps of note paper. Keep a log for, say, even the next week of all the times that seriousness is wielded, either by you or by somebody else. Either it's withheld or it's bestowed. And watch the gendering of it. It won't always be obvious, and there'll be class going on, there'll be race going on. Absolutely. You have to follow all those dynamics. But watch the politics of seriousness being wielded and see whether, in fact, if you don't ask feminist questions, if you're not curious about the politics of femininities, plural, and the politics of masculinities, plural, if you're not serious about them, what will you miss? Thank you very much. They, uh, those developments should have been really, in some ways, um, aiding those people who've been w working um, towards the compensation for those comfort women, or at least getting the uh, uh, formal apology from the Japanese government. It doesn't seem to be really happening too much, talking about not being taken seriously. So I was wondering whether you'd have some words of advice or some words of encouragement. How do we get there? Because it's been uh, the decades since it's those decades. I mean, and, and, and it forward. took three. Oh wow! Look at this. <laughs> three, it, oh, this is a well-equipped university. Two mics. Um, but the did some of you you, you heard what Yumi is? Yumi is a um, specialist and a researcher on what the Japanese Imperial Army called the Comfort Women, which were women who were forced into prostitution. Uh, to service um, Japanese uh, soldiers in Korea especially. I think that's where the largest number. But also in the Philippines. I know, I know it's a terrible subject. Um, um, uh, um, th in the Philippines, in Indonesia, in Taiwan. Um, and so um, it's what's stunning is how long nobody took it seriously including the U.S. occupying forces in Japan. From 1945 to 1993, the U.S. occupying officials in Japan knew about the Imperial Japanese Army's system of quote-unquote comfort women. And because they wanted Japan, the Japanese government, never to be confused with the Japanese people, the Japanese government to be their new ally in the Cold War, 
they, in fact, did not want to raise this issue. So, in some ways, U.S. government officials who did learn of this horrific policy of the Japanese Imperial Army, they did take it seriously, but they took it seriously in a way that completely dismissed the lives of the women who'd survived it. Now, thanks to Yumi's work and the work of um, women in the Philippines and in Korea and in Taiwan and in Japan, Japanese feminists who've been very assertive in uncovering this story. Um, now we know a lot more. There is no way in which anybody can deny, although Japanese nationalists do, but it is very hard to deny actually what happened in World War II um, to all these women who were forced into prostitution to serve as Japanese rank and file soldiers. But it's been very hard to keep the issue alive. One of the things, and Yumi knows all this, but one of the things that has happened is that a lot of Korean nationalists have kind of embraced it to death and used the issue not as an issue of justice for women or to raise questions of sexual assault in Korean society or those sorts of related questions about the nature of patriarchy and militarism, but rather have embraced it as one more reason for Koreans to be suspicious of Japanese. So you can treat something as serious, but deny its um, authenticity as a distinct issue by kind of hugging it to death as a nationalist. And this oftentimes happens to issues of injustice to women. That is, injustice to women is reduced to injustice to our women. And once you have demoted injustice to women to injustice to our women, that is, subsumed it under a nationalist cause, um, you have really sucked a lot of the seriousness of it um, out. Do you think that's true, Yumi? The... No, but you already knew that. <laughs> I mean, really, I read Yumi to find out these things. Hi. Oh, great. Great, great, great. Hi. So I wanted to, um, when talking about like international issues, I was curious about, um, I think her name is Catherine McCann. She was an international lawyer. And yeah, McKinnon, there Catherine you go. Catherine McKinnon. Yeah, Catherine McKinnon. And I, I wanted to hear a little bit more about her because, or at least from your perspective, and I was surprised you didn't talk about her because from what I understand, um, she worked with Croatian and Bosnian women and against the Serbs and said that forced, I think it was prostitution and impregnation was a genocide. And I think that was like a big turn in people's ideas about when you're talking about like wartime, uh, sexual assault and that sort of thing. And I wanted to, I guess, open that floor because that interests me a lot in terms yes, of talking absolutely. about Syria. Yes, Catherine McKinnon, who is a feminist uh, lawyer here in the United States, is most famous um, in the American imagination, I think, because of her work against pornography. Um, and so that's where her work is probably best known. But Catherine McKinnon did indeed uh, become very engaged and enraged um, as information began to come out about how systematic the rapes, um, not it wasn't entirely male Serbian soldiers assaulting Bosnian Muslim women. That was the dominant, you know, in, it's crass. In numbers, that was the dominant pattern. But there was rape and sexual assault used by men on various sides. And I, just to do a little detour here, um, it, we now have information from Bosnian feminists and others that also, because remember, masculinity is wield, wielded by men against men, and in an effort to feminize men on the other side, numbers, we have numbers of documented cases of 
Serbian male soldiers raping um, Bosnian and Croatian male soldiers in an effort to feminize them and thus humiliate them and thus um, paralyze them with shame. Um, but coming back to, to Catherine um, McKinnon, yes, she is um, one of this circle of um, investigators and um, people who've spoken out um, on the what we now know, we have documented, were rape camps. Um, and um, the reason I wanted to feature the, the Yugoslav feminists is because I really think it's really important that we listen to local documenters. This is true in Rwanda as well. Um, the, and in, certainly in the Congo, where Congolese women in the DRC are amongst the um, most energetic documenters of the use of systematic wartime rape to wage war in the Congo as well. So yes, Catherine McKinnon has been very um, energetic and important in raising the issue and making it um, well known. Those of you who've never read a court case and don't think that reading the court cases are exciting, go and read the either the Yugoslav um, International War Crimes Tribunal, there, that's in The Hague as well. That's the forerunner to the um, permanent war crimes tribunal, which by the way is kind of misleadingly, its formal name is the ICC, the International Crimes Court, the ICC. But many people refer to it as the permanent war crimes tribunal. Read their cases where people have been convicted in The Hague and in the Rwandan uh, trials, which happened in Arusha, that's in uh, Tanzania, but they were the International War Crimes Tribunals for Rwanda. Read the findings. Read what the judges based their findings on to come to the conclusion that systematic wartime rape had been perpetrated and the person who was on trial should be held accountable for it. They're groundbreaking, history-making uh, cases. Look at how those cases are presented. Hi, I'm going to change the subject a little bit. Sure. Um, recently, I attended the ISNA convention, which is the Islamic Society of North America convention that was here. It had oh. about 30,000 Muslim people from all over the country to come oh. and attend. Mostly they talk about Islamophobia and trying to be more American and being accepted. But there was a small group of Muslim women, uh, mostly um, African-American women who have been Muslim for, let's say, 20, 30, some of them born into Islam but are now my age or a little older. And they started this group about, um, and there's a study about inclusiveness in the mosque. And there, if you want to talk about like a place where women are not taken seriously, you have to go to a board meeting there. So there's one tomorrow. And I'm going to that one tomorrow. And I wanted to really talk about inclusiveness as opposed to just being sort of like a Pakistani, you hear my quote, Mark's, <laughs> Pakistani mosque or an Arab mosque, which really they are. The, the boards are these kind of like people, a group, let's say ours is Pakistani because almost everybody on the board is from Pakistan or Bangladesh. And they think they're like back home as soon as they, they come you know, into the mosque. And I wanted some suggestions as to how I could be taken seriously at that meeting, I am a convert and an American, and you know, sort of, I don't have any of their cultural sort of uh, power. I mean, that's really what it is. It's having power. I don't know anybody. Nobody's related to me. There's no, you know, I don't have somebody who, if they say anything to me, will be insulted, and that will come back to them over there, and their wife will be upset with them all night. You know, so I don't have any of that power. And if you have some suggestion as to even some material or something I could present, and like like you said, the um, I forgot her name. I'm so sorry. The one who went to talk with Mr. Yes, Carol. Like, thank yeah. you. Um, something that I could present with and start off with that could kind of get them to take the topic more seriously as I go into the issues that are important to me or to I think to the mosque and community. That, that's such a challenge. Um, I think in any um, group, particularly a group that has invested a lot in the way the group is, right? It, it means a lot. It feels sometimes probably like a life raft, but it certainly has a lot of value invested in it per, and personal um, commitment uh, to it. 
one of the things to think about, and you'll know this much better than certainly I could, um, is to think, what is it that, in this case, the mosque, but it could be any group. It could be a sports club, and that doesn't mean to take less seriously a mosque, but it could be a political party. It could be a sports club. It could be any kind of organization that people feel intensely about the membership. And try to think through what is it that this organization, whose members are quite comfortable with the way it now is genderly organized, with women marginalized and men given most of the authority, what is it that they're losing? What is it, or in your case, what is it that, quote, we are losing? What is it we're losing by perpetuating this kind of um, marginalization, this kind of hierarchy, this kind of pyramid? And that's, it's hard to do, but I think it's the one thing that moves people to think, well, we could do it differently, and if we do, we actually will be more vibrant we will be more respected. We will be more satisfied with our own experiences of being a member. And one has to really think that through to figure out what that would be. But I think a lot of groups that are exclusivist, when the, the cracks begin to be made, oftentimes you find that the cracks also lower the level of fear because sometimes groups, and I'm not at all sure whether this would be true of your mosque members, but oftentimes people stay exclusivist and or hierarchical, or both, out of fear, out of that sense that um, if we do it any other way, if we open the window, if we put up the shade, if we made the door wider, um, that in fact we will be vulnerable. Whereas, in fact, what most of us have learned, because all of us have been in some kind of exclusivist organization or community or neighborhood at some point in our lives, is that the very opening, once it's embraced, in fact, makes you feel more at ease, less vulnerable. But while the exclusiveness and marginalized pyramid goes on, it's very hard to imagine that. Um, so that's not really a strategic reply. Um, but it might, it, it might help to open up a conversation as what would be lost? Right? What, what would we, what, how would we be made more vulnerable rather than more vibrant? Right? OK, there was one, one last question over here. Um, oh, great. Um, so my situation, I went to like uh, an all-girl private Catholic school for high school, and there's a brother's school that we coordinate with, um, so it's not that weird. But I had, it's Catholic, and it's, so there's some religious parts to it, but I had this one radical teacher that would teach the senior religious class like, about rape and pornography and systematic rape in like war times, half the sky was required reading, stuff like that. Um, and she's been there for like 10 years, and every year, she teaches girls, and she tries to contact the boys' school to say, can she teach a couple classes to them, just to expose them to gender issues, not necessarily attacking it, but just so they have more awareness as we do, and has been denied 10 years straight. So I feel like this is exactly what you're saying about not taking serious about the gender issues. What do you think about that, and like, what do you think could help her so she can get through to the boys' school? Yeah, wow. Well, um... One of the things that Anne and Yumi and Brett and so many of us know is that um, oftentimes very patriarchal, male-dominated institutions don't think they have to talk about masculinity. Right? They really they reduce gender to women. Now, Lord knows, well, maybe he doesn't, but, uh, but <laughs> somebody... Um, knows that, in fact, it is important, and that's why at Georgetown and at my university, what, what's the name of women's 
the women's studies program here. Is it called women's study, women's and gender studies, or women's studies, women and gender studies, and sexuality studies? Um, and these namings really matter. But one of the things that every women's studies program has tried to do is not to let go the word women in a women's studies program. It was such a battle to get women to be taken seriously as the objects of thoughtful, rigorous, academic investigation that we are not going to let that go. Add gender, yes, but don't let women go. So there's a politics of women's and gender studies. But gender, and women's studies has done this from the start anyway, but it wasn't that visible, but women's studies and feminist and an analysts have been very interested in and have explored masculinities from the start. And I think a lot of people who are totally unfamiliar with what goes on in women's studies courses and what feminist research looks like and what gender policy studies. Do all of you know Heidi Hartman here in the city? Holy, good grief, folks. Heidi Hartman, um, who's now at um, George Washington, but she started the um, Institute for Women's Poly Policy Research. And if you want to know what a feminist analysis of the labor market month by month during this recession and before it looks like, go to the IWPR, to Heidi Hartman. So a lot of us know that you have to keep track of women and men if you are going to make sense of the way gender works. But I think for your um, good uh, teacher at that school, it might be really interesting for her to provide, and she probably has done this, a syllabus that really makes pretty explicit that there is investigations of, explorations of, investigations probably scare the hell out of the boys' school. Call it explorations of interest in um, the histories of manliness, the histories of masculinities um, in the United States and internationally. And perhaps that will catch somebody's eye across the street. But it's hard. The other thing is she should find at least two faculty members across the street who are interested in this because there are more and more um, people who are teaching mainly male students who are very interested in this uh, kind of uh, uh, work. Um, and so if she could get a couple of allies across the street on their faculty who says, well, actually, I do some of this, this work. I'd love to have those courses. That might be quite persuasive. Everything's political, right? which means you can change anything. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, again, Cynthia, um, just before everyone runs off very quick, notice that uh, the, although this is a wonderful uh, lecture, it's not actually the last uh, uh, event of the day. We're going to do something a little bit more relaxing, a little bit more fun, um, which is over at the Katzen Art Gallery, which is just across there at 6 p.m. There's a tour of the Occupy This exhibition. So especially for people who've come from out of town, if you want to see what Occupy DC was like, um, that'll be on, and at 7 p.m. there's a public performance of uh, what's the first read through of a play called McPherson Madness, which was, is written by um, a woman who was really a stalwart of the information tent at McPherson Square as part of Occupy DC. And the play is about how she uh, struggled with and, and balanced and the, the issues she faced being a mother and the expectations on her to be a mother to her children and be an activist in something as full-time as, as occupying a public space. Um, so really talking about those uh, issues that I think um, have been raised this evening with this lecture. So uh, Katzen's just over there, and I'll wait outside if anyone wants to walk over together. Otherwise, um, tomorrow morning, uh, pack starts back up again at 10 a.m. You can come and get bagels and coffee and, uh, and look forward to a full day um, of sessions, including uh, another keynote uh, from... Uh, the esteemed archaeologist, uh, Dr. Randall Maguire, who's right here with us. Um, so uh, hopefully see you all tomorrow. And if you're not coming back tomorrow and you have a name badge, then uh, leave it at the front here. That'd be great. Thank you.
Bye.